Welcome to the management space of SWPS University. Uh, this is another meeting in the series China Talk, a series of interviews with leading global experts on China, on East Asia, which is produced jointly by the SWPS University and by the Polish Chinese Business Council. And the interviews are hosted both by the president of the Polish Chinese Business Council, Mr. Zbigniew Nieszobenski. Zbigniew, welcome. Hello. Hello. And by myself, my name is Marcin Jacobi. I'm head of the Department of Asian Studies here at SWPS University. And please remember that this is a live webinar, so you can ask questions. And as far as we can manage, we will incorporate them in the discussion so that uh, uh, we, at least in this way, can do it as a, as, a, as a joint meeting of all of us, not only the three of us here in the studio. And uh, today, our very distinguished guest is uh, Mr. Jirki Katainen, president of CITRA, the Finnish Innovation Fund. Uh, uh, president Katainen has had a, a, a wonderful career. Uh, we are meeting here today mostly because of his previous uh, position at the European Commission. He was vice president for jobs, growth, investment and competitiveness. But prior to that, he also served as prime minister and as Minister of Finance of Finland. He has had a very long career as a member of Finnish Parliament, 15 years, and I'm sure he knows everything not only about Finland, but also about European Commission cooperation with China. And this is exactly the topic of our meeting today, as we will be looking behind the scenes of comprehensive agreement on investment between the European Union and China. President Katainen, a very, very warm welcome to our webinar. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you, and thank you for your time. Zbigniew, the floor is yours for the first question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, for accepting our invitation. It's a great honor for me and for us uh, to host you in our China Talk series. So we know that during the eight years uh, as Vice President, of the European Commission and uh, in your second term of office uh, responsible for investment, you were, were involved in the difficult negotiation with China. After more than seven years and 35 rounds of negotiation, the European Union and China reached a deal on a comprehensive agreement on investment just a day before the deadline that the both parties had imposed themselves, namely to the end of uh, 2020. Was that the moment when you could open a bottle of champagne and say, yes, we finally got it? Well, uh, first, first of all, let me thank for inviting me to this very uh, interesting uh, format. I do appreciate that there are business, business organizations and business uh, communities that are interested in understanding the relationship between the EU and, and China, because this is something which is in change, in, in move at the moment. So I, I did open a bottle of champagne in, in the last year of, uh, of last year, last the day of last year, not only because of uh, uh, the New Year Eve, but also because of uh, this investment agreement I negotiated several years on that, and I was not that sure that the, that the compromise or the decision, decision uh, could be reached by the end of the deadline. Because um, deadlines are sometimes quite flexible in trade and investment agreement negotiations. But uh, I, I was very happy, and, and even happier I'm now when I have had a chance to read it through. So, so in principle, if everything is implemented properly, it's a good, uh, good agreement, especially for European businesses and societies. So let's start from the beginning. At the beginning, the EU Commission has repeatedly stated uh, that it's not yet ready to negotiate a trade agreement with China, but only the investment deal. What was the result of this position? The main reason for not negotiating on comprehensive trade and investment agreement was that we are quite far apart as systems. So 
China, in one hand, is a strategic partner for the EU, but at the same time, it's a systemic rival. So it would have been too big step uh, to take in one hand or in one uh, step to, to start negotiating trade agreement. And that's why we wanted to start uh, with investment agreement. And that was also the mandate what our member states at that time, 28 member states gave to the European Commission. So I can see that someday there is a trade agreement within the EU and China, but uh, first we have to see how well this investment agreement functions and how well both parties will implement it. There are lots of um, obstacles in this way still, even though the negotiation result is very good, but still we have to, to concentrate on the implementations of different chapters of it. Yeah, well, now, now, of course, the relations between the European Union and China are very dynamic. The changes are big, of course, influenced by big politics. But we would like first to go back these seven years and ask you about what was your personal, but what was also the perception of China as a business partner for the European Commission, for the people who are involved in the negotiations at the early stages. If we could try and Maybe imagine what were the differences between this, these attitudes and the attitudes that many of the politicians at the European level have on China today. Yeah, first, I have to say that I had very good negotiating partners, two, two uh, vice prime ministers, like, uh, like we call two vice premiers. Um, the, the latest one was Liu He, who is quite well known figure also when we watch the news uh, of the negotiations between the United States and, and China. And before him, there was uh, Vice Premier Ma Kai. So the negotiations were very pleasant, very polite, and we shared many common views. But having said this, I have to say that I did not always understood why things wouldn't have happened faster. And the only explanation why the process was so long uh, and slow was that, that, as I said before, we are also systemic rivals. So, um, for instance, the level of market access uh, was one of the areas where we had disagreements. Of course, the EU wanted to get as wide, as large market access as possible. Also. Uh, the role of state-owned enterprises was one of the big issues because uh, in China there are a big amount of very significant uh, state-owned enterprises which are very often subsidized by public, public money and the competition between our companies, European companies and SOEs has never been fair. And um, also other questions regarding the subsidies was uh, on the table. And, and finally, the sustainable development chapter, which is now baked in to investment agreement, was something completely new. So all those three basic elements of the investment agreement were, uh, the, were uh, a kind of issues where we had fundamental uh, differences in, in our negotiations. Mm -hmm. So, so that's why I'm so satisfied that finally there's a compromise and agreement on these three main elements. So the basic motivation in the EU side uh, to, to get the agreement was the level, the playing field between EU companies and uh, Chinese companies, because uh, the EU is relatively open or almost fully open market for Chinese actors. But this is not the case for European companies in China. So there is much more to win in our side than in their side. And, and that's why the negotiation process was not um, typical uh, 
uh, trade negotiation uh, setup because usually in trade in trade agreement negotiations both sides have equal amount to to win so you 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 basically try to find a compromise i open my market here you open your market there and then we make a compromise but this wasn't the case in this uh, this eu china investment agreement because uh, we are open they are not so so it it took just a long time for chinese counterparts to to digest w w what outside wanted okay so the motivation on the european side was probably stronger uh, what at the beginning just 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 last question about the beginning of the negotiations what was the motivation on the chinese side to engage with the commission on these lengthy negotiations um, i guess one of the motivation uh, area was that they wanted to deepen the economic relationship with us because the eu market is the wealthiest and the most advanced and the largest market uh, and they wanted to to build better economic relationship with us. The size matters, so so that was one of the reasons. So this was a rather political observation. The second thing is that of course uh, China wanted to get something from our side, and they 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 did better investment environment, even though our market is almost open for for Chinese investment already. And uh, third. Uh, they also understood that uh, European investment in China will uh, develop the country positively. So, so th that was our main argument, that why you keep your economy closed if you could benefit from our investment. And, and uh, as they are not a fully open market economy, they uh, were assessing whether it's more beneficial to allow Western or, or European investments to come increasingly to their country, or do they have to protect their own businesses from uh, external competition. But finally, they, they ended up to, to accept that, uh, that usually societies develop um, uh, through better um, pro, uh, through better competition and new technologies and new investment. Uh, so the negotiation last uh, very long. Yes, uh, I can only say that or compare with the negotiation with the agreement between the European Union and Japan for the economic mm -hmm. partnership. And uh, this agreement was finalized maybe three years ago, uh, three years earlier. Yes. So, uh, okay, but so many, many experts underline that the, this uh, agreement looks like, uh, looks more like a letter of in the, uh, intent. Uh, um, so there are many places uh, when the negotiation will be, uh, so the, the, the final uh, uh, re um, solution will be discussed. So, uh, uh, so, uh, when we can uh, expect the final version of this uh, agreement? Usually, trade agreements or investment agreements are um, the, the, the final uh, or the first outcome is that there is a yeah. there is a political agreement on yeah. on on issues. And then it will be translated to legal text. And we are now in the first phase so that there is a political agreement between the negotiators uh, from commission and, and uh, Chinese government negotiators. And we know everything what has been agreed. And, and, and now um, both sides are translating it to, to legal text. I don't have... Uh, exact date in my mind when the legal text will will be ready but i guess uh, very soon and then uh, starts the ratification process so uh, all the member states 27 member states should accept it and and also the european parliament and 
And I must admit that it's not self-clear that we can get this agreement through uh, just like this, mm -hmm. because um, because of the current tension between the EU and, and China and between um, the, the problems with Uyghur uh, minority in, in China, etc. So there are lots of political tension in the air, and this may uh, bring some obstacles to the ratification process. Even though, if you look at the agreement and compare it to the current situation, where we don't have an agreement, and we don't have a level playing field, we don't have a reciprocity between uh, uh, the economies, and still we have human rights problems, etc. So which one is better? to live in the current reality when we don't have any leverage on human rights and sustainability issues and we neither have reciprocity in, in economy or to have an agreement where economy, from economic point of view we have more level playing field, more reciprocity and also political uh, lever to influence sustainability issues. Yeah, okay. You mentioned that the ratification process is probably a very long journey and if we could ask you about the behind the scenes on the European players, because of course European is uh, European Union is not a homogeneous organization institution, and you have different countries, you have different personal uh, outlook on or, or approaches towards China. Who would you say, or what are the fractions, or maybe which other countries which uh, are? maybe more motivated to carry the process through and they are trying to sort of pull the whole process through the through the ratification or what can you tell us about what the relations between the different member states uh, look like in this particular issue yeah all the member states have not been that vocal either in favor or against but um, when I was a negotiator, I had a full uh, support from the member states because uh, the situation, the negotiation situation was taken to the European Council every once in a while. And, and we explained to ministers and to head, heads of states uh, the situation of the negotiations. And we, we always got um, full support for our work. But uh, always after the negotiations, uh, there's another momentum which uh, people can find differently. So we have seen or heard some critical, quite significant critical voices from uh, French public. They have been criticizing also many members of the European Parliament have been quite vocally against this agreement. But, uh, but uh, I have an understanding that that all the member states are still in favor of it because I remember three years ago uh, 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 the main discussion line was that we have to do whatever it takes to level the playing field between China and, and Europe because people were mostly uh, mostly um, uh, uh, critical that Chinese can can participate to our market and our companies are not allowed to participate freely to Chinese market and 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 this lack of reciprocity was the major problem also people were quite rightly uh, worried about uh, subsidized acquisitions so we mostly talked about Chinese acquisitions in Europe which we thought at least partially are publicly subsidized and of course we cannot accept this so this agreement also partially address all these worries which we have had, which are legitimate worries. So um, I hope that that uh, public audience and MEPs would compare really the current situation to the situation which we could get after um, having this agreement, because uh, things would get better from human rights point of view, from sustainability point of view, and from economic competitiveness point of view. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned the, the Xinjiang issue and the growing political tension between, of course, mostly US and China, but also European Union and China. 
Would you say that members of, um, of the decision-making bodies in the European Union are more uh, on the rational side or more on the romantic side if we uh, borrow the American political uh, tax here? So are they more interested in sort of very pragmatic work with China on the investment issues or are the political issues affecting also the perspective perception of whether the, the agreement actually should be ratified? Yeah, investment and trade agreements are always politics. They, uh, one can see them pragmatically. I'm, I belong to this camp. I, I try to look, uh, look at this kind of stuff very pragmatically. But uh, it's also understandable that people want wants to mix uh, kind of legitimate political considerations to investment agreement. And some people have said that why should we get an agreement with China once they are violating the rights of uh, certain eth ethnic minorities? And this is a good point. I mean, I'm, I'm also against of violating minority rights or using forced labor or, or, or whatever. But, uh, but then some people who are using this kind of political rhetoric, which I think it's it's part of uh, part of, part of all the politics, they they seems to forget that this agreement is much better because it gives better leverage to the EU to influence to forced labor issues or other sustainability uh, development. Uh, related issues than without an agreement. So, so as I said before, there is much more to get for us Europeans than than for Chinese. So, so I, I no matter what from what angle I look at the agreement, the current situation is not better than than the situation with an agreement. So that's why. Uh, it would be sad if if people wouldn't look at uh, look at look at whole whole substance of the agreement. We are not giving anything uh, for free. We are getting much more, and we also get the political leverage to influence the human rights issues. Okay, so uh, I would like to to return to the negotiation process. So. Uh, uh, you told uh, us something about the atmosphere of uh, this negotiation, but we observe uh, uh, some time now, for some time now, that Chinese diplomacy have been shifting from conservative, passive, and discreet to assertive, proactive, and vocal, aimed uh, at defending uh, China's national interest, often in a confrontational way. We saw this new approach, uh, for example, le uh, recently at the U.S.-China uh, summit in uh, Anchorage. So uh, this new approach has been dubbed Wolf Warrior Diplomacy. Uh, in the course of this uh, few years of negotiation, have you observed any change in the negotiation style among Chinese diplomats towards uh, a more aggressive one? Um. I have not seen this personally. So our negotiations on on investment agreement was very polite, sometimes not as speedy as uh, as uh, we would have wanted. But uh, but the tone of the negotiation was uh, was uh, was good. But I have also seen the change in 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 the Chinese diplomacy. So there are a few things which we all have to understand that first of all China has a legitimate um, goal to become a world biggest superpower. So all the countries have a legitimate uh, uh, will to become as influential as possible. And, and China is now much stronger than it has ever been. So if, if looking at the size of the economy, it's bigger than it has ever been. If 
looking at a number of significant techno technological giants. There are much more of them in China than ever, ever uh, in, in the history. China is stronger uh, militarily than it has ever been. And it wants to take its um, superior position in the world. So, so we have to understand this fact and take it as a fact. But at the same time, um, we have seen that China is using a methods which we doesn't need to accept for gaining more power. For instance, in the, in the field of economy, subsidized acquisitions or subsidized production or capacity in steel and, and other products. Um, and, and also the day investments to Europe or to the United States has risen the question of uh, national security. So what, what wonders me the most is that we have to be careful not to get into the technological trap which means that that um, when technology is changing so fast and some technologies like 5G networks or others, for instance, um, rare earth metals which are used for batteries, if they are in the hands of one producer, then there is not competition. And if there is not competition, there is not market economy and we are trapped. We are in trap. Mm -hmm. so, so the current situation where technology is changing so fast, um, there is a bigger risk than in the old world to end up being in technological trap. So in that sense, we doesn't need to accept everything what China is doing if they are not using the international uh, rules and regulations. And that's why we need to team up, for instance, with the United States and Japan in order to maintain level playing field, in order to support multilateral trading uh, system, which is not necessarily in the interest of, uh, of China always. Mm -hmm. So, so um, yeah, I, I mean, the, the things nowadays are different than, than just a few years ago or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. What were the most difficult issues during the negotiations uh, and were there any important issues for the EU, EU that could not be dealt uh, with in this agreement? Well, I, I think most of the areas which were in our interest are dealt with this agreement. Of course, the market access or the level of market access could have been bigger, but I'm quite satisfied already to, to the level which the negotiators achieved. Uh, maybe the sustainable development chapters and the role of uh, state of enterprises and 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 uh, state to state dispute mechanisms those those were the most difficult because china has never done anything like this before this agreement between the eu and china is a landmark in china's negotiation history because they had never agreed anything uh, anything like this uh, from scale point of view than mm -hmm. what they did this time. So from market access point of view and from, from sustainability uh, access, development, uh, sustainable development point of view. Mm -hmm. So uh, w what was the input of member states during the negotiation phase? They were extremely supportive all the time because, uh, as I said before, many people, many countries were worried about uh, the lack of reciprocity and the growing number of uh, Chinese acquisition in Europe. So when we want to be open for international investments, foreign direct investments in, in Europe, it's clear that all the countries want to make sure that there is, um, th that the competition is fair and that there is not uh, risks which would lead to unfair situation between domestic or European companies and 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 Chinese uh, uh, players. 
Yeah, here I would like to ask you about the, the timing. Uh, you mentioned several times the acquisition problem. Uh, isn't it not too late to talk to China about this? I mean, uh, don't they already have most of the technology that they wanted to acquire from the from the uh, European Union? I mean, you know, this problem has been there for ages. And, you know, we had a whole string of, of really very interesting acquisitions, especially in the automotive industry. Is there any space now for protection of European technology as, uh, as you see it? Well, um, economy and technology is uh, evolving all the time. Every year there are new, new technologies and new booming and growing interesting companies which somebody wants to acquire. So basically, in principle, EU is not against of foreign direct investments and acquisitions, but uh, the rules must be fair. And we don't, as we don't allow European companies to be sub subsidized, we, in the same way, we cannot um, allow third country companies to, to be subsidized when they acquire something or participate to our market. So a lot has already done uh, or, or happened, but, but still uh, I believe that the world is changing and developing every single day, so, so, so this is important. Actually, the, this investment agreement is not the only tool we have in our hand. Commission proposed four years ago investment screening mechanism, which many member states have implemented already. So it means basically that that uh, member state is giving information to another member states in case of uh, foreign direct investments in order to improve the level of understanding and knowledge what happens and because um, for instance um, if third country companies acquiring large European company it might have subsidiaries in other EU member states and it may have some impact either economic or security impact to different countries. So this is another uh, tool which can be used in Europe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just to but follow on that question, just one little thing. Do you think maybe maybe sorry, sorry uh, I want only to, to, to ask uh, uh, about this, uh, what you mentioned. Uh, so about this screening mechanism, yes? Uh, whether the agreement will replace the local national investment uh, protection solution that have been implemented in many countries earlier? No, actually, no. Uh, some, uh, I mean, I don't know exact number or, or the situation today, but uh, four years ago there was only 13 EU member countries who had some investment screening mechanism. Mm -hmm. And now the number is... Uh, Bigger, but I don't know exact exact figure. So this investment agreement will not replace national uh, national screening mechanism. This comes on top uh, of everything. So this is more like market opening uh, agreement. And when it comes to national investment environment, then then it's uh, on the hands of member states. Okay. Okay. And. Uh do you think that the European Union is as attractive now as a as a place for foreign direct investments for China now as it was seven years ago? The dynamics seem unfavorable for the European Union. Well, I think the EU is quite attractive, or or it has become all the time more attractive for foreign investments because, for instance, because uh, we have agreed on several trade agreements with different partners, like with Japan, with Mercosur, with Canada, with Mexico. We are negotiating with, uh, with uh, Australia and New Zealand. So if you, uh, if you want to get a good market access to all those third countries or third markets, uh, Europe is a good place to be. The second reason is that our technology is uh, developing. We are a wealthier market than before. We are forerunner, for instance, in in circular economy, in many technology areas. We are very good and forerunner in in robot uh, sector, especially when it comes to business to business or manufacturing robots. So um, our our role has not diminished. 
on the contrary. So I, I believe that that Europe is even more attractive than seven years ago. And, and investment screening has not changed it. Even though Chinese, I remember they were complaining me that we are crea creating investment screening mechanism in Europe. But I, then, then I just said to my counterpart that how, how come you are criticizing us because you are exactly the same in China and it's even stricter. And we are only interested in, in security matters and subsidies, nothing more. So, so we are open and you are not. So they, they, they tried to criticize us a couple of times, but then, uh, then it stopped when I, when I was pushing back. Uh, I only added that 2020 uh, has shown that the, the European Union countries are the, mo uh, are the key for Chine uh, Chinese overseas MNI. MA, yeah. so uh, which should also explain China's interest to sign the EU China uh, Comprehensive uh, Investment on Agreement. So, exactly. yeah, yeah. So, uh, I want to ask you uh, who can we call the good father of this deal? You? Well, that's a big. Uh, well, uh, I hope I'm not impolite, but I would say that Liu He from China's Chinese side, he has been uh, a good negotiator, supporting uh, the, the the agreement. And from our side, uh, Valdis Dombrovskis was uh, the one who was uh, taking the negotiations to the end. And then I have to raise, of course, uh, Chancellor Merkel, who has been, she has been very active on that and wanted to finalize and keep the set date. So Germany's support was very significant on this. But then, of course, President Macron, whose position is not that, that um, clear. I mean, the political support in French is not as strong as it has been in Germany. So President Macron was also crucial for getting this uh, agreement done. And, and he also was very interested in sustainability development chapter, which is very good. Um, and, and yeah, those, of course, in, in China presidency, of course, is uh, is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was very much interested in, in what you said about the um, uh, uh, agreement being also a path for China to reach other countries that have um, trade and investment agreements with the European Union. Do you think this might come in handy now for China as the U.S.-China relations deteriorate? Will China try to bas bypass some of the American policies through? cooperating first with Europe and through Europe with other partners? I don't think they have any any chance to buy bars American um, sanctions because um, I mean, the sectors which have uh, restrictions set by Americans are not necessarily the same uh, as what Chinese own companies uh, do in Europe. So, so it's basically the restrictions, American restrictions to Chinese productions are more uh, in the area where the added value of the product is not that high. So in that sense, uh, China and the United States needs to needs to find a solution. And I, and I do hope that they find a solution this um, EU-China agreement could also help to, to bring new elements to international trade rule book, because China has already accepted many things which they have not accepted before. So it could, this could be a kind of um, first step to create new market regulation in global law. Yeah, and speaking of this, uh, we have one question from our viewers, from Ms. Uh, Sylvia Kanya. She has the question that goes a little bit closer to what we just talked about. 
um, she's worried that the psychological sort of sanctions game that she calls tit for tat between the EU and China will push China more towards Russia. Do you think there is uh, such a such a danger? Um, well, uh, if looking at the facts and figures, um, EU never or, or Russia can never replace EU in 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 economy. So EU EU's market is the wealthiest and most integrated, uh, the biggest market in the world, open, open market in the world. In in Russia, Russia's market size and openness is totally something different. So we cannot compare the two in terms of economy and trade. But of course, in, in political issues, they they might might find themselves. But again, when China wants to be a giant in all imaginable areas of business, in economy, in military, in, in politics, in everything, um, Russia is not big enough uh, to to cooperate with uh, and uh, kind of uh, forget EU and the United States. Of course, uh, they they can find themselves in certain political issues, but but um, then the the economy of size matters in in politics too. Okay, so it seems like you're very positive about the position of European Union in trade relations with China. That European Union is more or less indispensable for Chinese rise also in economic terms in, in, in global economy? I believe so, because if you if, if you look at the numbers, that the EU is a significant investor in China, even though the market is not open. And it could be even bigger in, in, in coming years if we accept this or implement uh, the investment agreement. Uh, and, and also our wealthy market is uh, is something which is very very interesting for Chinese companies. So, so um, I I see clearly that things have changed profoundly, so that China is bigger than it has ever been. It, it's more influential than it has ever been, and uh, and it wants to to become even more influential in all fronts, and and it causes problems, but at the same time, the development is very important for our development too, in, in politics, but also in economics. So we are strategic partners and r systemic rival, and everybody sees our position. So we cannot do business for getting human rights, for instance. It is just like this. Europe is like this. And, and that's why I'm so uh, glad that we have managed to get this invest, uh, investment agreement negotiated because it includes sustainable development chapters. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mr. Jacobi, uh, ask you about the geopolitical uh, context of this agreement. And uh, what you can say, uh, many experts, which emphasize the anachronic nature of this agreement, agreement pointing out the European negotiators have completely ignored the changing political environment, geopolitical environment, and that uh, this agreement does not fit uh, in with the current situation. Uh, you mean that uh, the change, uh, the, uh, I mean, the United States and... Uh, yeah. And they, yeah. For, for example, this uh, yeah. context and this context that at the beginning of the negotiator, China was for us a uh, partner, now is uh, a rival, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, first of all, on uh, the US-EU relationship, so um, we have a dialogue with the United States, which will provide an opportunity to discuss uh, on the common challenges we face with China. This wasn't the case under 
Trump's administration. He was uh, acting unilaterally. He didn't want to discuss with us, even though we shared even his time during his time, uh, the major uh, concerns like overcapacity on on various product groups or subsidized uh, production or acquisitions and uh, this technology uh, potential technology trap issue so we have agreed with uh, the united states and japan on all these issues and and now when uh, president biden took the office we believe that we have better chances to share the views and try to find common approach to address these issues. Um, but at the same, same time, it doesn't mean that Europe could not uh, enhance its own position vis-a-vis -vis China. This is nothing away. This invest, investment agreement is not anything away from US-China uh, relationship or EU-US relationship. And, and we, because the fact is that we, we have suffered about uh, asymmetric um, market situation for ages. Uh, why we should wait for somebody to do something which we don't see happening anytime soon. So, so the, I, I find it important that the European Commission is um, is uh, defending the role of the EU's EU companies' uh, posi position in Chinese market and want to enhance the market cooperation between China and, and the EU. But um, I, I do expect that there are better cooperation between the United States and, and, and the EU and Japan on various issues. For instance, data. Data policy is increasing question because the amount of data is increasing significantly in coming years and data is becoming a raw material and all raw materials have always some sort of regulation how to use it how to exploit it how to to i mean what is fair way to use raw material and there japan the united states and and the eu uh, are close to each other and and we should we should uh, try to write a global rule book on, on data use, for instance. Mm -hmm. I agree this, uh, that this uh, agreement uh, isn't against the US. Uh, this is something, other situation which we have uh, when uh, US uh, sign uh, reach a phase one agreement with mm -hmm. China, yes. The situation, this agreement wasn't so good for Europe. Yeah, exactly. So the United States, during Trump administration, uh, did some sort of agreements where they bypassed their natural allies' interests, Europe's interests, with, with, with China, and and we didn't like it at all. It was bad for us, even though the actual impact to American industry wasn't that good neither. But uh, but nevertheless, they were not interested in, in, in our opinions. So uh, this is not a penalty to Americans, but this is very comprehensive uh, agreement, including market access, level playing field, sustainable uh, development. And it, this is something completely different than anyone else has ever done with China. Mm, okay. I'm quite cu curious, you, you mentioned the consultations that uh, you had during the negotiation process with the US and with Japan. How about South Korea? Also a very important trade partner for China, also an important trade partner for, for Europe? Well, um, we consulted all the different parties and were open for our partners. Um, but I don't remember that different parties or different countries were that interested in, in our negotiations. Maybe because they didn't believe that it will ever happen or we will ever get an agreement. Maybe that was the reason. Or then there were other trade issues 
uh, trade-related issues in the air at the same time. And also because we were negotiating with different countries on real comprehensive trade uh, agreements. So they were more interesting for many other countries than, than this particular investment agreement, which is not a trade agreement. Okay, the Biden, the President Biden administration recently announced an executive order to build a China free tech uh, supply chain. So why the US pushes for decoupling the EU aiming to increase its investment in number of sectors in China. So uh, at the same time, the EU declared, you mentioned it, uh, its readiness to cooperate with China in the area of its policy towards China as part of uh, transatlantic cooperation. This is a, a bit like the EU trying to have a cookie and eat a cookie. What mm -hmm. do you think about it? What pr priorities should be uh, for us be now? Being pragmatic, I think it's international trade is always good and international foreign direct investments are always good if they are not a threat for national security and if it, they, does not, uh, they, they don't diminish the competition. So those are the two, two issues um, with which we have to be careful. We are open for Chinese investment in Europe, but we don't want to get into the technology trap we don't want to uh, diminish, diminish healthy market competition and we don't want to get security threats. So if we, if we manage to kind of harness this kind of situation, then the economy is open. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, we share the same concerns with the United States and Japan on, on security issues and on, on market uh, uh, market development. So, so um, our kind of um, two-track approach is not contradictory. We can open the market for healthy business and, and then we need a wider shoulder with like-minded markets, countries to limit unwanted consequences. Um, okay, so uh, I would like to ask you about our local, uh, this uh, region, our local market. So we observed for uh, some years the huge amount of Chinese investments in Europe, especially in Scandinavian countries, in France, in the UK, Germany, uh, in Italy. Uh, so. Uh, I'm interested in your opinion. Uh, what do you think uh, if the uh, Central Eastern Europe uh, could be interesting for uh, Chinese investors? Why not? Many Central Eastern European countries are <clears throat> economically competitive. And uh, that's a good basis for, for investment. Um, then there are also good manufacturing companies and tech companies. So why, why not? We have also seen some negative development in some Central Eastern European countries when it comes to Chinese investment and cooperation, which I understand well. So, so the relationship must be equal. It must be reciprocal. And no one should uh, end up to the situation where the other party is superior. And, and th this is not quite clear in current situation. So, so this uh, Chinese 17 plus one format, I first said in public that it's always good the more our member states are cooperating with, with China. It's always like this. But um, it cannot lead to the situation where where some of our member states ends up being um, uh, connected too closely to one country or end up being blackmailed 
and and uh, because uh, then it's it's bad for the individual country, but also bad for the entire European Union. So so the fair, transparent, open cooperation with China and Chinese companies is always good by all means. But but um, we have very good European wide regulations on on trade and commercial activities. As as long as people follow them, there is no no risks. Mm-hmm. And what uh, uh, what is your assessment about Bel- uh, Belt and Road Initiative? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's another good question. Um, There are positive and negative examples of that. Mostly negative examples comes from outside of Europe, from Africa, especially. So, so the reputation of Belt and Road Initiative is not as good as it was, let's say, some four years ago. I have discussed with Chinese authorities on this initiative and, and we have been supportive or, or when, I, when I still was in the commission, we were supportive uh, saying that that all those infrastructure investment ideas you have are, they sound good, we are ready to contribute to, to achieve them, but all of them must comply with our market regulation. So no subsidies, Uh, open competition, open uh, and transparent rules for financing, etc. So, so you you can build roads and railways to Europe as long as you comply with our competition rules and and healthy uh, healthy economic principles. But very little we have seen happening in 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 Europe uh, uh, from from this initiative. And do you see the the European institutions as uh, more of regulators for EU Chinese trade, or also leading the narrative on the trade? So, do you think there is uh, um, they just need to prepare the ground for uh, competition and and free economic cooperation between different players and different part- partners between China, or the EU, or are you more inclined to sort of try and build? common narrative or more common strategy on economic cooperation with China for the whole EU, which we know is very difficult. I think both are important because, um, for instance, this investment agreement is um, is uh, uh, one type of achievement which creates a regulatory basis for investment uh, between the EU and, and, and China. So this is kind of a regulation forming exercise. But then there are uh, other economic activities which does not necessarily fall under this agreement. They go between individual companies and individual countries. And um, the EU as a whole has a joint interest to follow and comply fully with our competition rules. So me as a Finnish citizen cannot accept that that there is a third country company getting subsidies from another EU country or from the third country and winning market share uh, so that other EU or Finnish companies would lose to this uh, subsidized enterprise. So in that sense, this this common market regulatory environment is very important. It supports and, and safeguard the whole EU. And finally, we need a joint narrative because political reality is uh, changing. There are different political uh, issues in different countries. So we need to share the view What are the things we are ready to defend? Okay, so I understand that uh, this, uh, agree- this agreement is beneficial for both, both sides, and we can say that this win-win deal, uh, and this is a better even uh, if they uh, 
some experts can say that something is not wrong. Uh, it's uh, this agreement is better. The situation is better than uh, just one before. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay, but my last question, because we must finish, is uh, what is the finish Chinese relationship now? Does competition from Nokia and the other entire discussion over the implementation of 5G technology affected this relationship? Not really. Actually, uh, Finland has achieved quite a number of Chinese investments, but they have gone mostly to, to other sectors than strategically significant areas. For instance, online game sector uh, has has got a lot of uh, Chinese investments. Also, many startup enterprises have been acquired, etc. They have been active, Chinese have been active exploring opportunities to invest in traditional sectors like uh, pulp and paper. No one of them has yet materialized, but it's possible that someday something like this could happen. It's a brownfield investment. So, uh, and, and also some greenfield field investments uh, have been on the table yet. So things are, things are quite good. And uh, the Venice China economic relationship is, uh, is it, it functions well. So one cannot say anything negative on that. But um, of course, uh, Finland is part of the EU and we have to look carefully how the market is developing and evolving. And, uh, and uh, the public debate is cautious. Uh, I mean, even the big public or audience says or thinks that it's good to get Chinese investment in Finland if it creates new jobs, but we cannot get trapped. So, so there is a kind of healthy, uh, healthy way of thinking that welcome if you are if you have normal business interests, but then we want to be careful if if, if there are something which is uh, which sounds suspicious. All right, President right. Katainen, I'm afraid this is all we have time for. Thank you very very much for being here with us and for giving us all the really interesting. Uh, insiders information on the process of negotiating the agreement and your view of the China EU relations. Uh, just to remind our viewers, our guest was uh, uh, President Yurki Katainen, now president of Citra, Finnish Innovation Fund, but before the vice president of the European Commission, vice president for jobs, growth, investment, and competitiveness. Uh, Mr. Katainen, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Katainen. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.